Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, welcome to NASCA TV. We're thrilled to have you dialing in with us today. As you're coming in, please take an opportunity to rename yourself. Um, just hover over your name, right click there, tell us your name and your state or your company so that we can see who's on the call with us today. Again, we appreciate you joining us for NASCA TV, where we're unpacking our emerging issues in state government operations. We have a wonderful set of panelists that will be with us this afternoon. We're excited to hear their thought leadership and um, want you to join in with us as well. Please take a moment to drop your information in the chat box where you're dialing in from today. If you'd like to share any of your social media information, please do that. We'd love to connect with you offline as well. And then we'll also have an opportunity to um, dig into today's conversation. So please, if you have questions for our panelists, please drop those into the chat. We'll be monitoring those. Our team will be checking it throughout the, the hour, hour that we're together today. So again, welcome. Thank you for joining us for NASCA TV, Sustainability of Federal Funding. We're gonna get started in just a moment, but we'll give just another few seconds for folks to join in join our audio, dial in and get settled with us this afternoon as we kick off the conversation around federal funding, where we're headed and what's happening in the states around sustainability. So as we kick off this afternoon, we've got a couple of poll questions that we want to start with today. So you have an opportunity to see what your colleagues are saying from around the country. And it's also a great opportunity for our speakers to see what you are experiencing in the states. So if we can bring up our first poll question, please. It's a very easy response there on Zoom. In your state, who has the primary authority to allocate federal stimulus funds? Is that your governor? Is your legislature involved? Or has it been delegated to the individual agencies in each of the states? Again, as we're thinking about who's responsible or has that um, lead authority to allocate federal funds, is it with your governor? your legislature, or directly down to the individual agencies. Um, interesting response is pretty equal across the board. Looks like a little bit more legislature. Um, no, now the governors are coming in as well. So about 40% both on the governors and the legislature, but several of our states are also saying 33% right now across the board, 33% uh, are saying that the individual agencies. So Tammy, will you show us the end results from our first poll, please? Interesting, the governor's just barely edged out um, the legislature and individual agencies with 43% of our responses. So Tammy, will you bring up our second question for us today? As you're thinking about those dollars that have come in to the state, Approximately how many new state programs would you estimate that your state is actually initiating with those federal stimulus funds? Got four choices for you there, one to five, six to 10, 11 to 20, or more than 20. And again, we're thinking specifically around the federal stimulus funds and those new initiatives, new programs that have been initiated within your state with those funds. We know those funds still have time to be allocated and expended, but currently where are you in your state? So again, two leading between six and 10. Um, it's just took the lead across the board, followed by more than 20. So a little bit of disparity between our states as to how many of those um, strategies and programs have been put in place. Timmy, would you be kind enough to show us the results of our second poll, please? 43% are saying six to 10, 29%, 20 plus. So interesting uh, that discrepancy between the state. Thank you all so much for responding to our polls. That's very helpful as we're beginning today's conversation. So we have these monthly virtual events as part of the national webinar series that NASCA does around our state priorities for our public officials, our state chief administrators, as well as the emerging issues. Really what's coming down the pike with state government operations. And one of the things that we're hearing from our members is what's going to happen once the federal stimulus funds are to run out, where are we headed? Are we already thinking about budget planning? So we wanted to talk today a little bit about 
the federal stimulus dollars and where we are going. We know that because of the pandemic, the economic conditions were impacted significantly. Then there's this influx of funds from the federal government and revenues really came to a screeching halt in almost every state. But with those federal stimulus packages, um, there's all this new federal funding that's happening in the states. Along with that, there's a lot of accountability, reporting, other mechanisms that go into play. So we know that the states are working to utilize those funds to recover from the massive economic hit. But there are still a lot of questions that are existing over the use of these funds. And again, as I said, the accountability and the sustainability. So today we're going to talk a little bit about how states are planning so that they can avoid that risk of dipping deeply into rainy day funds to continue the work that they have begun. So we're going to look at workforce challenges, we're going to look at reporting and oversight challenges, as well as how states are looking at budget planning for the next several years. So let me introduce our three excellent speakers who are with us today. We have Shelby Kearns, who is the director of NASBO, one of our strategic partners here at NASCA, works with the state budget officers. We have Cornelia Shebno who works with um, NASACT, which is the Accountants, Comptrollers, and Treasurers, another strategic partner, and then a member of our executive committee, Dr. Rebecca Holwerda, who is the Chief Administrative Officer in the state of Indiana. So we're excited to hear from all three of them. We're going to hear from not only their members in the national associations, but also from Rebecca directly in the state and how she has been put as far as oversight in her condition there in Indiana. So Shelby, let's kick off with you today hear a little bit about what's happening at NASBO. I know you all just came off a very exciting um, member conference. So what are you hearing from your NASBO officials and your members? Thanks, Pam. It's always nice to be here and, and to have this opportunity to share a little bit about what we're hearing. And uh, as Pam mentioned, uh, NASBO just had its summer meeting. And so there's you know a lot of talk around these issues, a lot of, a lot of planning. Um, and we, we are hearing the same themes from all of our members. States are uh, often, often you don't hear the same things, you know, states are, are uh, have different economies and different things going on, but we're really seeing strong fiscal conditions in all states. Um, and I think to step the stage, we'll just talk about that a little bit, that, that these state fiscal conditions are remaining very strong. Um, we've heard a lot of pessimism around that, but the, the the fiscal conditions on the ground really don't match what kind of what I would say our, our feelings are. And a lot of um, a lot of what what I feel about that is that we're things just have felt like there's so much upheaval the past few years and things don't feel great. So we sort of expect economic and fiscal conditions to mirror that. Um, but they really haven't. States, states are still in strong conditions and we expect that for the next year. NASBO conducts a few 50 state surveys. Um, each year to gauge fiscal conditions. And our last one covered governor's proposed budgets for fiscal 23. Um, and at that time, the um, just to kind of give you a snapshot of, of what governors were expecting, what we thought was gonna happen then, um, we thought fiscal 2022 general fund revenues, they were, esti they were estimated to go to 3.2% at that time. Um, so of course that was in the spring and 49 states said they were coming in above those um, those projections already, and you know, I, I think we know that that uh, that held. Um, in fact, I, I would say every state, from you know, just a quick scan of headlines, has come in above what it expected. Um, we had one state say that their surplus was the largest in history, except for last year's. Um, so it also gives you just kind of an idea of how big these numbers are and, and how sustained that is. Um, the governor's budgets for fiscal 23 were based on forecasted general fund revenue growth of 1.4% compared to those estimated fiscal 2022 levels. And you know, we've started the fiscal year strong. We're already seeing reports of states exceeding their revenues um, that they expected for July, and in some cases by quite a bit. So again, we're we're seeing we're seeing very strong conditions. And a lot of that is the it's the impact of inflation, which of course makes us as consumers feel um, feel a bit bad about the economy, of course, because things are costing us us more. But um, the impact of that on on state revenues is actually is actually a positive. So as we you know as things cost more, the um, you know your whatever your sales tax percentage is is a is a higher number. So that um, 
that results in, in stronger sales tax revenue as we're seeing you know, rising wages that, that uh, translates into stronger income tax revenue. Corporate uh, income tax revenue has been very high uh, in states. Um, you know, and that's that's those those revenues we're seeing from this these um, stronger prices, and and in uh, the the states that rely on on severance taxes, our oil and gas states, of course, that has also been um, been a positive for them. So as far as state revenues, I think the the things that are making us as consumers feel bad about the economy are actually translating into positive state revenues. There have been talks that those revenues will soften. Um, we are already seeing the impacts of kind of a, a return to normal in consumer behavior. So shifting from purchasing goods, which are generally taxed to services, which aren't. And, and we do expect to see less travel as school starts. There was a lot of pent up demand. If you tried to travel this summer, you know just how much pent up demand there was for travel. Um, we expect that to, to soften. So some of those, those things will trickle through into your, your state economies. Um, but some of the other things we're seeing like you know, we're seeing consumers sort of downsell, maybe buying uh, not name brands or something as prices go up. Those, of course, don't impact state revenues because people are spending the same amount of money. Um, so those those types of consumer behaviors that we're seeing shift in the economy are not translating into lower state revenues. And of course, we all know that that unemployment remains very low. And so on, on the expenditure side. Um, in fiscal 2022 budgets, general fund spending was projected to increase by 13.6% over fiscal 2021. Um, this is actually the largest expenditure increase in over 40 years that we've seen in our, um, in our surveys. So that's significant. And that growth rate is driven by a lot of things, but I would say the, the largest um, driver of that, these are you know, general fund spending, is one-time surplus funds. So states spend down those funds that keep building up as they beat revenue um, projections. Usually on one-time events, we're seeing um, expenditure, those percentage growth of expenditures really, really um, be driven up. For fiscal 2023, governor's proposed spending increases of 4.2%. Again, it's going to be spending those surplus dollars. Um, so in the, when, when we finally get through fiscal 2023, that, that percentage increase might be higher as well. And there's still a lot of focus. Um, you know, one of the, the reasons why we're all here today is to talk about federal funds and, and those impacts on state budgets. And, and what we saw in our last state expenditure report was that total state spending, was, so that's general funds, other state funds, bonds, and federal funds, it was estimated to have grown 16.2% in fiscal 2021, and that was another, that was a first, that was the highest rate in the in the 35 year history of our state expenditure report. So that gives you an idea of how much um, states are spending. And, and of course that translates into greater economic activity and, and is another reason why we've seen such a strong economy. Um, spending from states own funds rose 5.7% in fiscal 2021 and federal funds really increased that, that spending increased very sharply um, by 35.7%. So those are still, uh, that was still pretty early. If you think about fiscal 2021, that was early in terms of getting the state and local fiscal recovery funds out. So we, we expect that that's gonna stay really high. Federal fund spending is gonna stay very high. And that's, that's really where states are focused right now are, are implementing their recovery fund spending. And, and in many cases are still making decisions. They're implementing grant programs. So we'll continue to see those funds make their way through the economy. Um, states did recently post their reco recovery plan performance reports um, for those funds, and those reports are looking forward. So they're talking about uh, not what states have spent, but they're talking about what states and territories plan to do. And that's really important, you know, as, as we try to look and see what, where, where states are going, where we might see these fiscal cliffs emerge. Um, and we, we've had a chance to kind of look through preliminary allocations um, in, in about 33 of the plans we've gone through. So what I'm sharing is actually our first glance at that. We haven't even shared this with NASBA members yet. So um, that's how preliminary it is. But since, um, since I had it in front of me, I thought I'd share it with you today. Um, the largest slice of what we're seeing that states are planning to spend funds on are on negative economic impacts. Um, a little over a third of those funds, that's where they're, um, 
where they're planning to, to direct those funds. And so a lot of that is probably one-time spending. That's probably, you know, helping um, those who are impacted, whether it's, you know, housing programs or income support or some sort of, um, some sort of support to get through the, the, the pandemic and the effects of that. Um, that 17% is going toward infrastructure. So those are, those are one-time expenditures. It's a very small amount, about 1% directed toward premium pay. And we are seeing with that, that's mostly one-time. Um, a lot of bonuses, um, those types of things were, were implemented because people don't want to set up something that's unsustainable with that. And then another large uh, pot is revenue replacement. That looks like um, with these first 33 reports, about 35% um, directed for revenue replacement. But that sounds, so it sounds like, you know, we have programs and we're, we're backfilling existing um, state program spending. And that's not really what the revenue replacement category is. It's more of, it's a calculation that states were able to, to make and and the, the dollars that they're spending in that category have a lot less reporting restrictions. So as a lot of you know in this call, there's some pretty onerous reporting restrictions or reporting requirements with these funds. And in that revenue replacement, there's, there's fewer reporting requirements. So as much as they can, states are really taking advantage of that. So we're seeing in that category, even things like infrastructure spending, um, but they're just being reported under revenue replacement as a matter of convenience. So we're, we're, we'll need to dig into that a little bit to get a better sense, but I just wanna make sure everybody knows that's not, that's not the, the you know, over a third of these dollars are being pumped into ongoing programs. I think that's really important. But then um, when I think about what, I, what I've mostly heard from, from NASBA members about where they're at and what their focus is on, it's really on the challenges of deploying so much one-time funding. So we've got these federal funds that are one time and then all those state surplus dollars and trying to do that in a sustainable way, in a thoughtful way, um, really, really takes, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of effort and you have to be really mindful because a lot of people don't understand how much of that is one time and that there are, um, you know, out your problems you can set yourself up for. So that, that challenge really seems to be what is weighing most on everybody's minds. Thank you, Shelby. That's really, really helpful to hear. And we appreciate you giving us a sneak peek at some information that even the NASBO members have not heard. So it sounds like there's a lot of one-time spending going on, but also some other um, avenues that states are looking at. Would you say it's a pretty equal mix or is it heavier on the one-time spending? It's definitely heavier on the one-time spending. Um, and, you know, uh, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about this later, but the one of the things that states learned so well coming out of the Great Recession was not to set up those fiscal cliffs and not to pump, you know, start a lot of new programs. So we're seeing a lot of um, time limited programs. So they may have started a new program, but it's not it's not set up to be ongoing. Maybe it's, um, you know, it's it's a two year housing program because they have housing funds or something of that nature. Um, but we would still consider that one time. So there's the um, states are being very judicious in this regard. Thank you very much. And is it true still, Shelby, that um, the funds can be expended all the way through 2026? Is that still accurate? Yes, they need to be obligated by 2014 and then expended through 2026. Great. 2024, oh. sorry. I don't know why I keep I keep saying um, 2016 instead of 2026. <laughs> I think I just can't get my mind around what year it is. Scary, scary thought to think that far out in the future yeah. or what it feels like might be far out in the future. Thanks, Shelby. We're, we're going to talk back with you more here in just a moment. But let me introduce um, Cornelia from NASACT. And Cornelia, I know you all um, are coming on your new summer uh, event just next week here in the next few days. I'm sure this is going to be a hot topic there as well. But as you and I were talking earlier, um, you brought up a really interesting component in addition to the fact that accountability is huge um, along with reporting, but also the fact that um, the workforce issues in the states have become so much more significant related to the federal funding. Will you share a little bit with our members what you all are seeing at NASACT? Sure, and, and thank you, NASCA, for inviting me to participate in this session. I'm excited to hear all of the other panelists, and I think uh, I was glad to hear that Shelby said a lot of the money is going for one-time 
uh, investments, certainly on behalf of our treasurers, you know, credit agencies are watching closely. And so I think um, the fact that states are being wise in how they're spending these funds and they're being careful um, not to spend these funds on recurring items that will cause problems down the road is really good to hear. Uh, infrastructure, building maintenance, et cetera, that is one time, um, I think are, are great things. Um, so anyway, uh, let's get on with this. Um, Thank you again for having me here. This has certainly been quite an interesting and big undertaking uh, on behalf of my members. And my membership represent really the three functional areas of finance at the state level, and each with a different role um, so far as the implementation of the various pandemic funding packages. As I mentioned, the treasurers were really at the front end, uh, not so much anymore, but at the front end of receiving those dollars and their biggest concerns surrounded the deposit deposit of those funds and making sure that the deposit was made to the appropriate account at the appropriate time. Initially during the CARES funding, a collateralization was a big issue. Uh, I guess Treasury had put out some of the money to the states, which is, a, as you know, a very, very large amount, showed up on midnight on a Friday. Uh, and so there was some concern on behalf of the banks in terms of the collateralization of that large uh, amount of money coming into the accounts. And then we've got the controllers. They run our accounting system for the states. Uh, and in many cases, they work alongside of Shelby's members and the governor's office on these implementation teams, determining how best to distribute and spend those funds. And they're also responsible for that back end reporting, uh, which Shelby briefly mentioned, uh, and how onerous that's been. And lastly, our state aud auditors who are coming in on the back end, and they're just starting to begin the audit process for those CARES fund and planning uh, again for the ARPA fund. So we, we won't have too much in terms of what they're finding just yet, um, but that's yet to come. But I will talk about a little bit of the fraud um, that's happening. So the accountability is really you know, what we stand for. And anytime that the money is distributed so quickly, the controls are compromised. The sheer volume of the funding, um, in addition to the fact that the federal government was saying that we needed to get this money out, to control the pandemic and get out uh, and help the people that really needed it, really exacerbated the issues in terms of accountability over those funds. As you know, uh, federal programs have requirements and controls to greatly minimize the amount of fraud. However, and again, in this instance, anytime you have an emergency, uh, it really chases a big challenge uh, for us in our, our community. And uh, I think one of the biggest problems that we faced initially was that the programs were managed by US Treasury, which is not generally an agency um, who manages grant programs. Therefore, with CARES in particular and ARPA following up, this is a brand new authority that they didn't have in the past. And they really struggled uh, to provide us with the timely guidance that we needed in terms of the parameters. And then as, as you know, if you followed this closely at all, that guidance changed several times. We had the interim rule, uh, and then the final rule has changed some of the things, and as Shelby mentioned, uh, actually expanded and reduced some of the reporting that we had to do. So there's just a lot of changes going on. Um, and, for, and from the auditor standpoint, uh, we follow what we call the compliance supplement, and that's what we use to test the controls against the various programs. Treasury was unsure you know, how to even do that, needed some help from OMB. Um, so a lot of things were late uh, to get to us just making our role um, a little bit harder. And then I know Shelby and Rebecca, who will speak to you next, uh, would agree that this lack of timely guidance, the changing guidance, um, and the details, the changing reporting requirements were not only frustrating for those at the states, but in some cases actually clouded the ability for us to provide the proper oversight over these funds. Um, for example, it was some time before we knew what our role would be in terms of these non-entitlement governments. Uh, they're the very, very small governments. Treasury was not clear at the beginning whether those would be direct recipients of federal funds or subrecipients. And if they were subrecipients, the states then had mo more oversight responsibility. Uh, at the end of the day, Treasury made these NAUs direct recipients, which confused the states in terms of what the state's responsibility was because we were serving as the interim actually distributing those funds. And we were not certain really that this was a great move by Treasury. Uh, generally, and from a state standpoint, when we get the money that we pass through, we do have some oversight responsibilities uh, for those entities. And so there were problems uh, in terms of the NEUs and even the after the fact. You know, These are very, very small units of government um, where they may or may not have an administrator in place. And if they do, uh, it's a part-time person or somebody that may have another full-time job. Even contact information for those entities was a challenge. 
And then one of the biggest challenges we also have going forward, and it's not unique to my membership, is trying to staff this additional workload, um, particularly knowing that some of these programs will not continue in perpetuity. On the controller side of the house, the work involved in navigating this changing guidance, assuring that dollars were identified. And then, as I mentioned, we, we serve on the implementation teams. So making sure that they're used within the parameters that are set forth by Treasury and other federal agencies, I was speaking treasury here, but there are lots of, uh, as you know, dollars that went out to all, either existing programs or new programs across the federal government. Um, reporting on these funds is extremely tedious. Uh, they've changed the portal twice now. Uh, and that was one thing I'm just gonna mention quickly with the ARA funds back in 2008, there was a great website that was set out by the, what they called the Recovery Accountability and Transparency Board. Um, however, when they farmed that out, I guess a lot of the information was actually owned by the third party vendor. Uh, so the amount of money to keep that going, they had to shut it down. But again, so now we're, re we're recreating the wheel, so to speak, with some new rec uh, reporting and oversight uh, portals and data gathering information. So I think one thing um, to keep in mind going forward, I think the federal government is going to look for a way so that that continues on uh, down the road for any type of new emergency uh, that may, may come into place. So I think, as I mentioned, the audits right now, we're just um, starting up to, on the CARES work. They're underway, and then we're planning for those ARPA audits. Uh, I think you're going to see a lot more in terms of the fraud that's out there. You've probably already read in the newspaper about the unemployment insurance program, and then also the rollout of the PPP program at the Small Business Administration. Anytime, as I mentioned before, that there's a need to get those dollars out quickly, uh, the opportunity for fraud uh, really only increases. And I'm just—I'll just give you a couple facts, and I don't want to go over my time here, but. Um, GAO actually issued a report just recently due to the historic job losses and demand for benefits. They feel that this worsened the existing problems that were already uh, that already existed in the unemployment insurance system. Millions of workers faced delay receiving benefit, benefits and then the risk of payment errors um, included those resulting from fraud were greatly increased. And I've got a lot of information here from the Department of Labor, um, but I'll just tell you one thing, this, this pandemic unemployment assistance program that was the temporary program that was created actually by the CARES Act, uh, um, the, I'm sorry, the CARES Act. And they, those gave uh, money to workers that don't ordinarily qualify for unemployment insurance, like self-employed, those gig workers, freelancers, contractors, part-timers, um, the con artists that are out there, were, unfortunately, were attracted to that, and they potentially had uh, perhaps more than ten to twenty thousand dollars per fraudulent claim. There were lots of set, lax security measures in terms of um, actually your eligibility for those programs, and so there's a huge amount of money that was lost. And then we're just starting to hear about that. But this program's not alone. I'm sure there are other programs that received a very large infusion of money, and I, I believe we're going to see a little bit of fraud there. Um, so you may or may not know, um, for, as far as fraud goes, it takes many forms. Um, the most common is identity, identity theft where criminals steal personal data and file the claim in somebody else's name. And this was a big one that was used um, for the unemployment insurance. Also, this self-certification uh, during emergency, the normal processes that were in place were not followed. Uh, and actually, individuals could self-certify their qualifications, which I think also opened up um, sort of got rid of the rigorous checks that are normally there during uh, traditional uh, unemployment insurance that were, were lifted because of the urgency to get this money out the door. So you'll start seeing some things, again, the news, you know, stimulus checks were mailed to dead people. Some of the small business loans were sent to those uh, that were not on the do not pay list. And so we're just gonna see some more of that. I would say that one benefit if anything that's come out of the work that we're doing is that we're working very closely now um, with the PRAC, which is the Pandemic Response Accountability uh, Committee. And if you don't know about them, I can provide a website after, but they've got some great information. They've set up a website showing where the money is going, how it's being spent. Uh, states are actually reporting in on the reports they're doing at the state level. And so the great thing about that is we're really starting to partner there um, in a number of areas. And then I did wanna talk briefly about the staffing challenges. Because I think I already mentioned that these were a, a challenge because the programs will not continue on in, in perpetuity. They're also a, program, a, a problem for us because the work will eventually go away. And so do you hire those in-house and then have to worry about what you're gonna do with those people going forward and the funding going forward once the federal government 
um, dries up. And then there's also the challenge of farming that out in terms of contract workers uh, and their ability to actually conduct these types of audits. So there, there's a lot wrapped into there. And I'll stop there for now, but have more to say in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Cornelia. That was really important. And of course, we know the audits and the reporting are definitely um, upon us now and coming down the pike as well. Anything else you'd like to share at this point, though, around the workforce, what you all are hearing from your members? I know you touched on it briefly that, you know, the states don't want to increase their workforce significantly and then have to eliminate those jobs in the next two to four years. But are you all hearing anything else from your states as to uh, maybe alternative ways that they're utilizing their workforce? So, um, yes, they're contracting out some of that work. And then as, you know, not unique to us, certainly all of state government employees, we were having problems attracting people that are actually qualified um, to do the work. You know, they talk about all the, we're bringing back some of the retirees to conduct some of the work and looking for really unique ways um, to bring people in. You know, we obviously we have to, um, and we're in competition with the private sector. They can pay a little bit more. So we try to really, um, talk about the benefits and, the, and the, the challenges and the rewarding work that we do. Um, so those are the things we're trying to, to really push to try to get some more folks in. Yeah, thank you so much again. We'll chat with you here in just a second. Uh, recruitment intent retention, it seems to work its way into every single conversation that we have. Um, every state is experiencing it and it continues to be a huge hurdle for most of our public sector folks. So um, again, Cornelia, thank you so much for your thoughts. Um, let's turn now to Rebecca Holwerda, who is um, our key leader in the state of Indiana. And again, as I mentioned, a member of NASCA's executive committee. Um, Rebecca, you came in at an interesting time into the role. And uh, I know you have taken on some new tasks associated with the stimulus funding. Tell us a little bit about what you're seeing in Indiana and maybe some of the processes that you all are going forward with as far as these new programs or initiatives. Well, thanks so much, Pam. Delighted to be here. I uh, love NASCA and being part of it. You guys just do such great work with providing information to all of us. So thanks for everything that you guys do and having me here today. Well, I think I have a little bit of a unique perspective as I was in the governor's office during the start of the pandemic, and now I'm the commissioner of the Department of Administration. So I kind of feel like I've been on both sides of the coin, so to speak, figuring out how to use the money and now on the back end, responsible for the implementation of uh, these funds. And in Indiana, like many of the other states, at the start of the pandemic with CARES Act funding, we were just trying to do whatever we needed to do to make sure citizens were getting services and people had what they need. You know, we weren't quite sure what was going to happen. And so we wanted to be really judicious and smart about what we were doing. Um, Governor Holcomb had complete discretion over all of the funds to be able to do what he thought was necessary for the state. Of course, we got the uh, calls, the emails of, we need 5 million for this program, 3 million for that program, and trying to sift through, okay, what are we really going to do here? And that's when he uh, created an economic recovery task force led by our Secretary of Commerce and our director of ONB with five other members that were really respected members of the community, uh, former Lieutenant Governor, legislators, business leaders, to figure out and make the recommendations of what should be funded with uh, the money. So people could submit proposals, uh, companies, individuals, organizations, everyone had some really fantastic ideas and the task force did a great job of sifting through all of that and kind of putting things in buckets for us to be able to make decisions about. Now, the one uh, parameter that we gave to them was that it needed to be one-time funding um, or part of an existing program because we did not wanna have any um, cliff funding at the end and be stuck with not being able to fund some of the programs. Um, we think it worked pretty flawless in having to uh, distribute those funds and when we got the second round, um, just so happens the legislature was in session and they wanted to also take part in directing where those funds were going to be. So it was a little bit uh, of a, a nervous time because trying to get seven people to agree on what needs to happen um, can sometimes be challenging, but then 
having 150 legislators agree on how things were going to be funded uh, is an even bigger challenge. They ended up by the end of session appropriating uh, 21 different uh, projects to the agencies with the um, caveat that it had to be used for existing programs or again, those one-time funds. So at this point, um, the governor had no discretion on the funds and it was up to the legislature. So if there was any changes that needed to be made, then the agency would have to go to the budget committee to get approval for that. And luckily we've only had to do one change um, as an organization did not meet the federal requirements to be able to receive the funds. So, so far it's been, it's worked out pretty well, but it has caused agencies to have to think a little bit differently uh, with more money in their programs and structure their programs differently with the federal requirements. Now with the additional funding, um, with the state local physical recovery funds, um, it's going directly to the agency. So like most uh, states, Department of Health, Family and Social Services, Department of Education, they're getting the majority of the funds um, that are going to existing programs where they can do a lot of grant making from. Um, in the beginning, uh, with the Department of Administration, we were doing special procurements uh, like nobody's business, because we were just trying to get the money out of the door to the people who needed it. But really, since the beginning of this year, we've pulled back on that. And we've been doing, uh, going back to the RFP process and competitive bids and letting um, different companies come up and show us that they're able to do the work and help us um, with tasks. And um, I'm, I'm pretty confident with our team and the time frame that we'll be able to get all of that funding out and still go through with the competitive bid process. Now, a lot of the one-time projects, you know, I have folks in my public works department that have been here 20, 30 years, and they have never had this type of money to be able to work with, whether it's deferred maintenance or um, we're doing a co-location for a blind and deaf community. Uh, with one school and with state-of-the-art technology to be able to service their needs. So being able to do some really cool projects that the state has always wanted to do, but never has had the funding to do, now we're able to do it. And that's a, it's a pretty exciting time to be part of state government. Thank you so much. Uh, Commissioner Hawada for your insights and provided some, <clears throat> provided some additional information on what the funding process looks like there in the state of Indiana. But um, we're gonna to pivot towards our uh, Brown Robin discussion on the sustainability of federal government funding. And we are hearing the states are preparing for a possible recession and have ongoing concerns for the future. How are states looking at recruitment and retention of the workforce? So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll take the first stab at that. You know, honestly, budget officers are, they're always preparing for a recession. And that's the first question that, that everybody always asks when economists come to speak at our meetings is, you know, what are the chances of a recession? How much longer do we have? So they're always preparing for the next downturn because we, we always know there's gonna be one. So um, I think a couple of things that I would just mention, uh, you know, for, for everyone to maybe feel a little bit more um, secure about those preparations is that states are really better prepared than, than I think they've ever been um, for, for a downturn. Rainy day funds are at record levels. I don't think, um, I know, you know, Cornelia was, was also around um, after the Great Recession and we never thought we'd see this level of, of funding in, in rainy day funds. So savings are high. Um, you know, states have strong revenues and, and have had these revenue surpluses. So we're likely to see more running day fund deposits and, and higher ending balance levels. States also have a lot of federal funds left to spend. So, um, and, and a lot of that is, is very flexible. So for the next few years, they, they still have that as a fallback. And states have also been using their unanticipated strong revenue growth to pay off debt, make deposits in rainy day and pension funds and shore up their unemployment funds and trust funds, all of these things that, that have them in, in, a, in a much better position than they've ever been in. So I think that's an important piece to that. 
um, you know, when it comes to recruitment and retention, everybody, you know, everybody here knows that that it's, it's a top issue because they're the ones, you know, in the trenches every day that are really feeling it. And and I always feel like states are at such a disadvantage because we have that lag in appropriation time. So um, it takes so much longer to be able to respond to higher wages. You know, you have to, you know, especially if you have to do any sort of collective bargaining, but you really have this lag between when something happens and when you can get it appropriated. So you're always a year behind and things are happening so quickly um, that we're, we're just really at a at an incredible disadvantage with pay. And I think that's really hard. Um, and, and so many limitations by law on what we can do with bonuses and recruitment. Um, we are seeing federal funds be used for premium pay and bonuses, but as I mentioned, a lot of that's one time. Um, we, we have a, there's a lot of stuff, you know, you'll see in articles where people are saying, states have all these federal funds to help with this. Why are they not um, strengthening their hiring? But they're still limited by law, limited by appropriations and, and very aware of that pending fiscal cliff if they you know, do increase pay with those federal funds. So it's been, it's been very difficult, but we do see states trying to make progress on um, both on, on what they're paying and, um, and on, on these things like working from home and all of the things that are making, making employers be a little bit more competitive. I don't know if Rebecca or Cornelia have, can add to that some more specifics. Yeah, recruitment and retention, always an issue. I don't think we've ever not talked about that being an issue. And last year, Indiana recognized, okay, we have got to do something different to be able to attract people and keep people here. And so we did put together a committee to look at the future of the state's workforce for the next five, 10, 25 years and figure out, okay, what do we need to do? We had small agencies, large, large agencies, veteran agency heads, new folks, um, just trying to get a wide swath of different perspectives of what do we need to do um, to try and start tackling this issue. And we came up with three phases of policy that we recommended to the governor to implement. And the first thing was everyone was going to receive a salary adjustment for the first time in 12 years of 5%, which that was a, a pretty big deal and very welcome news to state employees. Um, we went ahead and did flexible work schedule where everyone would be able to work at least two days um, remotely. We did a revised education reimbursement policy where you no longer had to stay a certain amount of time before you paid back. Um, if you left, to be able to have to pay back where if you got your degree and you decided to leave in two weeks, you did not have to pay anything back to the state trying to show that we are willing to invest in them to keep um, folks around for a long time. Uh, we did community service leave where folks can take two days out of the year to volunteer for their favorite charity um, to be able to be part of the community um, and kind of get a better sense of service. You know, Governor Holcomb's fifth pillar that we all live by is to provide great government service. And not only are we trying to do that to our vendor and um, agency and uh, constituent community, but we also want to be able to give back to areas that um, we feel very passionately about. And so this is one opportunity to be able to give employees the ability to whatever's close to their heart, be able to volunteer for that. And then we also did a re a reinstatement of retired employees. So if they retired, they can come back and work for the state um, for a number of hours at their um, wage as which they left state government. Um, so any place in the agency where they're very familiar with or if they wanted to help out in an agency and learn something new, they're able to do that. And we have found that to be um, a pretty good tool with people saying, okay, I'm going to retire, but I'm not quite sure I want to be fully retired and enticing them with their hourly wage of what they make when they leave um, for two or three days a week. It works out pretty well for folks. So we've been excited to see um, some of those small changes in our phase one really making a difference already. For phase two, 
um, dependent care, whether it's caring for senior parents or kids, it's a real issue. And so we're tackling, trying to figure out what can we do as a state to be able to help folks with some of those needs and possibly starting a, kind of like a health savings account for doing that with childcare um, for state employees. And our final phase is coming to uh, fast approaching. Next week, actually, we've been working on a compensation study. And I think Shelby mentioned, you know, we will never be able to pay as much as the private sector pays. But we know we have to do something and we have to be better at what we're doing. And so over the last year, we've taken all 900 uh, job titles. We have looked at what our salary ranges are. We know they're bad. Um, and first, making it uniform across the uh, state government so people are not jumping from one agency to the other for one or two thousand um, dollars, which then causes additional training and really um, puts a burden on both agencies to find new people and with the training. So we're hoping that having it be the same throughout state government, if people like their job, they can stay. If it's not something for them, they can move over to another agency that, that will help that issue. Um, and the biggest thing is looking at um, what private sector nonprofits and other state governments pay their employees and saying, okay, what can we do to be a percentage, um, you know, 80% of what the private sector is doing. And we finished the study. We're gonna look at the results next Tuesday. And I'm pretty confident that we're gonna be able to give state employees um, a significant bump in their pay, which we think will help retain the employees and also um, help us with recruitment of getting people that have some great talent to be able to help uh, provide great government service. And I'll just add on to all of what was said by both Shelby uh, and Rebecca. It, it's, a, it's a challenge and it, there's not a meeting that we have that we don't have at least one session looking at this problem of sustaining you know, our employees and how we attract them uh, in terms of how our folks are doing it. You know, a lot of our positions are CPA required, um, but they're reassessing those positions and seeing are, are there other disciplines? Is it journalism and other things that we can incorporate to bring people in because we just can't get the talent in the door? I think a lot of um, our folks feel like we can train them uh, once they get there, but then the problem, as Rebecca mentioned, is we train them and then they go to another agency that pays a little bit more. So I think we have a constant revolving door and definitely are, uh, I like what Rebecca said of all the things they're looking at. We've got a committee looking at ways um, to attract and retrain retain those employees. And they're also looking at the traditional way that we go out to look for people. You know, I think that needs to change with the younger generation. They're doing a lot more of social media. They're actually doing some video clips of some fun things um, that's happening in the office and in terms for the auditors in particular, you know, they, they work on some pretty interesting stuff and you can really get people excited if you present it in the right way. I think I, I would just jump in and add two, um, two specifics that I can think of that, that weren't mentioned were, um, I know Maryland has has looked at where they really do need to um, require degrees and where they don't. And I think that's really important. And a lot of job descriptions, we have you know sort of these arbitrary requirements and that, that weeds people out. But like Cordelia said, you, you can train people to do things. Um, and then Utah has a program that is adding, uh, providing support and helping recruit people who have a gap in their, in their employment. You know, maybe they stayed home to take care of children or, or something like that. Um, and it can be hard to get back into the workforce and, and maybe you need a little bit of extra help um, with that. And, and I think those are two really good things that states can, can look to, to, um, you know, to, to better hire people, create more opportunities and, and get people into the workforce. Absolutely. Uh, recruitment and retention will remain a major topic of discussion with respect to state government operations as uh, we are competing to um, hire talented individuals away from the private sector. So um, really interested to learn more about what's happening there um, in Indiana with that report. And I appreciate both uh, you, Shelby, and Cornelia for providing that insight on uh, that as well. So looking ahead to 2026, when all funds must be expended, what policies and practices are being put into place related to continuing the programs and initiatives created with those stimulus funds? 
So for example, we are aware that in Indiana, no new program can be implemented once those federal uh, funds expire. Yeah, so once federal funds have been used, all Indiana programs, they're going back to their operating pre-pandemic levels. You know, we anticipate there's going to be need for discussion about how things have been structured for the last couple of years. For example, Family and Social Services is using the majority of their funds for childcare and early learning, which has now caused the providers to do a completely different model and what they would normally do because they wanna get those federal funds. So we are assuming that uh, we're gonna to need to make some permanent changes to just how things have been set up. And we feel pretty comfortable with having those discussions based on what metrics we have set up to say a program has been successful, check to see were they successful, and then be able to change some of the outcomes based on the last couple of years with that federal funding. And it, you know, I think some states have um, similar processes to that that are that are set up to make sure that there there isn't an ongoing obligation. I know um, I'm from Idaho, and we had um, actually by state law had to have an exit strategy before we could utilize any um, federal funds, any one-time funds. Um, so had to address that up front, what was gonna happen. And, and I think a lot of states have those sorts of, um, either whether it's a, a formal or informal requirement. Um, we're also seeing a lot of states, of course, address this up front by um, using funds for, for those one-time expenditures. Um, there are a, a couple other strategies that states can employ, you know, they can, as they're, as they're moving through this process and, and using their one-time funds, they can create a new revenue source to continue those programs if it's something that they want to do, uh, want to continue, uh, but there needs to be something new in the revenue um, to support that. They can, of course, plan to use their, their revenue growth if they assume that, that revenues are going to grow. And sometimes you'll see that with um, the use of one-time funds as a pilot and that can kind of you know convince others that this is something we should fund with state funds. It can create some pressure from the public or something to um, to, to have that ongoing funding for a program, but um, really what, what we're seeing by and large, you know, there, there are some ongoing programs that have been, um, that are being created or ongoing um, pressures that are being created with these funds, but a lot of it really is, I think states are, are managing through it with one-time funds. And I was just add from a little bit of a different take, I think that the huge influx of money has um, caused the states and the federal governments to relook at the processes, um, some that are duplicative or burdensome, particularly when you talk about grants management, which will help down the line. Obviously, the, the, the money that we can save in efficiency um, can be used to continue on some of those programs. There's lots of duplication and overlap um, that the, this huge influx has showed us. And I think the federal government in particular is looking at how to streamline those processes. And some of that one-time um, one -time funding is being deployed towards technology that will help with some of that as well. Thank you for that. So we've had a very fruitful discussion on the sustainability of federal funding. And I just want to inquire on, uh, I want to inquire the group on, what is your one key takeaway from today's conversation? Um, you know, for me, I think that the takeaway, this happens anytime I'm talking to Cornelia, is, is this uh, kind of a, a lot of this around the, the influx of funds and how that has created such an increase in fraud and, um, and around these, you know, Rebecca talked about emergency procurements, and, and we see that quite a bit where um, the things that, that were hitting us in this crazy moment when the pandemic hit, you know, and I was trying to to kind of go back in that moment of like washing my groceries and stuff, I feel like it was a it was a crazy time, and trying to clean up some of that now and seeing you know as we go through audits, um, both trying to remember like oh wow we were just trying to survive and do the right you know states were trying to do the right thing and you had to do things a little bit differently, but um, I, I think it's just reminding me of how much work there is to do kind of looking backward. We're so focused on what we're doing going forward, but there is still a lot to work through on that that end of things, and that's. So that's sort of my, my takeaway is that reminder that Cornelia always gives me about that. I think it's just looking at, you know, we have these emergencies and, and we learn a lot of lessons from them, but we don't necessarily implement those lessons. Um, for instance, even in terms of the eligibility for a lot of these programs, 
um, something needs to be done about that. We can't just set that aside in terms of getting the money out quickly. The information has to be validated sometime, somehow. So do you use existing federal programs? You know, I, I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned um, in looking at past uh, experiences, whether that be ARA or now with what we're dealing with, with the pandemic funding and applying that to future emergencies. Yeah, and I would say just to communicate, there's so much opportunity to do some really neat and impactful things that no one thought that they would ever have this kind of money to spend. So it's important to communicate with the state agencies, with your grantees, with the vendors, with the associations, just to understand what the requirements are to ensure you're using the money properly. And the cool thing is, if you don't have the capacity or the expertise to do it, there are vendors out there that can assist you. And no one wants to, at the end of the day, have to give any money back. But if we're communicating with each other and we can kind of see where the gaps are, where you know we need to do things differently, I think there would be um, much more success in using the funding for its intended purpose and being able to um, do some things for a state that's probably a once in a lifetime opportunity that we'll be able to do. And just real quickly, one other thing, building on what Rebecca said, it sort of came to my mind now. It's really, as she mentioned, the collaboration, but we've never had, I don't think, uh, since since our, the relationship that we have now in terms of dealing with the federal agencies on the funding and really making a difference in terms of not being critical, but processes that are broken or the communication that needs to be required between all levels of government um, for that purpose that Rebecca just mentioned of really making sure that the funds get out there for their intended purpose. And like you said, Cornelia, making sure we learn the lessons, keep reminding people of we're all learning. So let's, let's go ahead and apply it next time instead of starting over again. So we had uh, one last question that came in uh, through the chat. I wanna make sure that I pose this question to the group before we wrap up this afternoon. How are states making sure that money um, is serving or uh, contracting disadvantaged communities? I would say from an Indiana perspective, um, setting criteria uh, in order to be able to reach the, the ones that really need it so that others that may not need it um, will not be able to make the requirement to get that. And that's only by having agencies that are embedded into the communities know where there are areas that the money can be spent and making sure that it's going to the right places. But I think there's lots of safeguards that you can put in place to make sure it's getting to the right group of people. Yeah, I think um, I think a lot of states are are approaching it the way that Rebecca said. It's you know trying to be to increase their outreach and um, utilize their existing procurement strategies. Now that we're through that emergency procurement, where if you weren't hooked in, you probably um, weren't able to benefit from it or get that business. And I think just as a, as a general term, this is not really in my wheelhouse, but I think that that's a lesson that can be learned is that you need to prioritize um, the underserved communities and how you go about that, as Rebecca said, by sending uh, setting forth some sort of a, a process for that. Absolutely. Well, uh, we want to extend our warmest gratitude to, to you, Shelby, Cornelia, and Rebecca for your time and for your insights that you provided us on our call. I um, also want to say thank you to everyone that joined us uh, for our second webinar on, on uh, my apologies, on the sustainability of federal funding. And our third webinar will be focused on emergency preparedness. And this will be held on October 19th at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you so much for your time today. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all on the next call.